Hi everyone, good evening. My name is Aviva. I work at Telfed. Thank you all for joining us, us this evening for a talk, a very informative talk by Diana Finzi. Thank you, Diana, about the special education system in Israel. So before Diana begins, I'd like to introduce Doron Klein, the Telfed CEO, to give a short presentation about Telfed. Thank you very much, Aviva. Thank you to you. Thank you to Diana, given of your time. And we welcome everyone who's joining us both in Israel, South Africa, and other places as well around the globe. I'm sure we'll learn a lot from Diana. So thank you, Diana. <clears throat> so we're going to dedicate just a few minutes to the organization behind this evening's event. And I'm going to share with you a very short presentation of three slides. <clears throat> So Telfed is our nickname from Tel Aviv Federation, from the days when our office was in Tel Aviv, and that was in 1948. And we just uh, commemorated Yom HaZikaron, and we had a memorial service at Shara Gai, at the Machal Memorial Site, and we were set up to look after the Machalnikim. There were 800 Machalnikim from South Africa. <clears throat> Machal is Mitnadvei Chutzlaretz, volunteers from overseas. These were soldiers that had World War II experience, men and women, that came to volunteer of their experience in the fledging IDF. <clears throat> and thanks to those Machal soldiers, we have a state of Israel today because they trained our army and they helped us win the war of independence. 123 Machal soldiers lost their lives from all over the world in 1948. And that's when we were set up to look after the 800 that came from South Africa. And they stayed in our, in a hotel that we rented in Tel Aviv and our offices were downstairs and we were called the Tel Aviv Federation and that nickname has stuck since then, Telfed, the Tel Aviv Federation. We have three main focuses, Klita, social welfare and our community. If we look at our action statements, is to promote successful absorption and the quality of life. So successful absorption is understandable. Quality of life, there's a big difference between quality of life and standard of living. We're not here to compete with standard of living in South Africa and Australia, but we can offer a quality of life being a Jew in the Jewish homeland that one cannot get anywhere else in the world. And the last slide relates to the three columns that we spoke about on the first slide. Klita, social welfare and the community. <clears throat> so Klita being absorption, it starts pre-Aliyah. As soon as possible, we want people to be in touch with us so we can plan their Klita. The earlier we start planning their absorption, the smoother the Aliyah process will be. So for those of you who have joined us this evening who are pre-Aliyah, the sooner you're in touch with Daniela, our Kita advisor, the better if you plan in Aliyah. You can see last year we had 550 Olim from South Africa. That's the highest number of Olim since 1994, since the move over to the ANC government. And we're expecting a similar number this year as well. <clears throat> we have volunteers all over the country. You can see I'm just moving over here, over 100 volunteers. And what we do is that we make contact with our pre-Aliyah clients and our volunteers. We have regional volunteers in 24 regional committees. So if somebody's thinking of making Aliyah to a specific region, before they make Aliyah, we can put them in touch with the regional volunteer who can tell them about that region, and give them advice before they even come to Israel. And once they land, then those regional volunteers are the ones that welcome them and help them settle down in their new community. There you can see Aviva with her mask on, all right? Aviva is not only in charge of events, it's also in charge of volunteers. We have 120 lone soldiers, 55 Australian lone soldiers. So again, before they come to the IDF, it's giving them advice while they're serving, it's helping them. And certainly once they have finished their army service and they need to adapt to Israeli civilian life, that's the biggest challenge. So we are there for them. <clears throat> it's events and it's counseling. Employment, you can get free employment <laughs> counseling. That's also before Aliyah. Once a person has made Aliyah, 
be in touch with our employment advisor. We also have a career counselor to help people who need to change their careers. We run seminars. We have volunteer mentors. So if a person has a specific um, career path, so today, for example, I spoke to an actuary, we can match them with a successful ole in that field who can give them advice on how they managed the Aliyah process a few years back and how they're successfully ensconced in their career. So that's the Klita pillar. Social welfare, we provide over 500 scholarships every year. <laughs> Some of the scholarships are based on volunteering. The students volunteer three hours a week, helping us absorb Olim. They receive a 6,000 shekel scholarship. We have scholarships based on financial need, which can be up to 4,000 shekels a year. That means people can get both. So we have some students that get 10,000 shekels a year in scholarships from Telfin. And we have the SASI scholarships, South African studying in Israel, that's uh, sponsored by the Samson family, whereby we have South Africans who have yet to make Aliyah. They're here as tourists, but they're studying in Israel. We believe that's a great Aliyah promotion program that the youngsters come and study here. And then once they've been here for three years studying, most likely they will make Aliyah. And uh, our latest program that we have um, in academia is a seven year medical program in English. This is a Telfed initiative. Today, students, English speaking students from all over the world, but obviously we did it for the South Africans and Australians, they can come to Israel, they can do a BSc degree at Ariel University in English, pre med, and then do an MD degree either at the Technion or Ben Gurion. And after seven years in English, they will be a qualified doctor. Social welfare we have a full time social worker, and we support 450 needy people every month. <clears throat> and uh, it's really putting bread on the table. Our social worker is very busy both counseling and providing actual financial assistance. You can see our apartments, it's a different color. We have 105 apartments in Ranana and Tel Aviv. <clears throat> These provide apartment rentals. So in that way, really it's connected to Kita. However, the reason it's here under social welfare is because 70%, 70 of the rental income goes to help the needy. So people do pay rent, but the rental income is used to help the needy. And then the last pillar, community pillar, we spoke about our regional volunteers. <clears throat> we also have a program called Teki, Telfit Ethiopian Community Initiative, which is South Africans and Australians volunteering to teach English to Ethiopian Olim. Our events, you guys are part of one of them. About 70 events a year, uh, thousands of participants bringing new and veteran Olim together, and some of them on Zoom, which also enables us to bring pre Aliyah people together with us as well. And the last bit is the community news. Our website, uh, Aviva will write the address in the chat. Please go into the website. There's a lot of information there. Our magazine that comes out, Pesach and Rosh Hashanah, and our newsletter. If you're not getting the newsletter, please send Aviva your email address. Once a month, you'll get a newsletter that updates you on everything that's going on amongst the South African and Australian community here in Israel. Facebook, if you're on Facebook and you haven't liked our page, please do so. Over 4,000 people that follow that Facebook page and Instagram as well. I'd like to follow, I'd like to end off before I hand over back to Aviva. And that is, you can see the Telfit is very busy helping a lot of people. If you're looking for a place to give your charity, you want your donation to go to a worthwhile cause, please think of Telfit. Aviva will post the donation link on the chat. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful and educational evening. And thank you once again to Diana. Shalom, keep healthy. Over to you, Aviva. Thank you, Doron. So I'd like to introduce Diana. Diana made Aliyah 34 years ago from South Africa. For the past 30 years, she has worked as an educational psychologist and supervisor within the school psychological services. She has worked with children of all ages from preschool to completion of high school. She's a trained clinical psychologist and psychotherapist. 
Diana will share her knowledge and advice regarding assessments needed, diagnosis of the child's major difficulty in the sphere of learning, as well as classroom settings available in Israel. Diana, thank you so much for giving of your time to share your knowledge with us. It's really, really, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. I also want to invite everybody to post their questions if you have questions in the chat box, and we will relate to questions at the end of Diana's presentation. So don't be shy. You can all, we'll also open uh, for questions at the end. So Diana, I hand over to you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> okay, thank you all. Um, first of all, what I'd like to say is in the 30 years that I was involved in the school system, I watched the field of special education growing. Um, it grew not only in terms of hours and budgets and trained staff and professionalism. It also grew in terms of finding, trying to find a suitable framework for every child according to their needs so that each child will be able to fulfill their potential, whatever it may be, and get the best education available to them, not in a narrow sense, in a broad sense, because in all these uh, settings, there's a whole team and a lot of in-service training to, to enable teams to learn to work together and share their expertise and um, help children, as I said, to fulfill their potential. Now, um, obviously, on, on the one hand, in order to place children correctly in the right framework, we need to know who the child is and what their difficulties are, obviously their strengths, but initially what the diagnosis is, what the difficulty is, so that the child can be placed in the best environment to meet their specific needs. And in order to do so, we need on the other hand, the parents' cooperation with supplying us, um, I'm not involved, I'm talking about us, because I was for so many years, um, the Vada, the, um, the committee that discusses the placement of children um, with a, a report, an assessment, which has been carried out by the appropriate professional, because different fields um, require different, different uh, professional experience. It's become very, very differentiated as we know. And uh, I guess like medicine, we're <clears throat> basically not, not as, as much as medicine, but certainly um, very specific professional knowledge is needed. So first and foremost, um, in, in each uh, different subgroup of um, special needs, population, I'm going to mention what reports are needed, um, done by whom. Now, first, before I say anything, two points. First of all, the reports have to be presented in Hebrew. Uh, in days gone by, when there were far less um, olim and far less frameworks, whoever was willing and able would translate the report that arrived. But now, there are too many, and we've got kids coming from France, Spanish-speaking companies, uh, countries, the the Far East, the Russia, Ukraine, etc., etc., etc. And so we we cannot expect the committee to to battle with somebody's semi-professional -prof translation. So um, this is something that I guess can be discussed: who, when. Can, can help with the translation of the report. Um, in addition to which, if you, the child's an ola, ole ola chadash, chadasha, um, they cannot go into special ed for two years. Now, um, if the child comes with an assessment, um, with a definite diagnosis and so on, and explaining and verifying that the child was in some sort of a special ed setting in their country of origin, whether it was a kindergarten, whether it was a, a special class, a special school, then that's fine. 
then one understands where the child's difficulties are. But a child with a presumed learning difficulty or a presumed whatever it may be, has to be here for two years and go through the whole klita situa situation. They will get their sha'ot or lim, where they will be taught Hebrew and um, hopefully helped as much as possible. And this is another reason why it's so important to arrive here with or to send in advance, as Doron was talking about, to send the necessary um, data reports so that whether it be Ariella or whoever it may be, a Telfed can look through these documents and see whether they are the ones that are needed in order to place the child uh, in the proper place so that the child, first and foremost, can benefit from being put in the right environment. Um, another thing I want to say, it's essential that your child, and this is much easier, has a visual assessment and an, a hearing assessment before they come. That's an absolute essential because sometimes the child just isn't hearing so well and then speech developments affected, et cetera, et cetera, from the spoken word to the written word and so on. So um, that's, a, that's an easy one is to come with those uh, documents, medical documents. So let me now um, talk about, I think probably the largest, um, with the, the largest amount of the budget and the hours and the professionalism goes, and those are children on the autistic spectrum disorder, ASD, okay? And um, over here, the documents required are two independent diagnoses by a medical practitioner. In other words, usually psychiatrist or neurologist uh, who specializes in um, autism and not an educational psychologist unless they've specialized in it, a clinical or developmental psychologist. Usually the, I don't know in South Africa, but in the Western world, the um, test, the assessment device is called ADOS, <clears throat> Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule, which is, um, it's, it's a universal language where if that is used to assess the child, then whoever reads the report knows exactly on which level the child's functioning well, where the difficulties are and so on. So I assume that that's what's used in South Africa as well, because uh, I know that um, the, they, there's international training and, and outreach. Um, another important thing is, if your child was diagnosed on the autistic spectrum before the age of three years, and you've arrived here and the child is now six years old, and the original assessment um, no, I don't think the hearing and visual reports need to be translated. That's, that's absolutely uh, any um, optometrist or audiologist will be able to make sense of those reports. No, I, I wouldn't think that's necessary. Um, so coming back to you, you arrive here and you've got a five-year-old child who's on the autistic spectrum but was diagnosed before the age of three. Um, unfortunately, an updated assessment has to be carried out. And the reason for this being that in the previous DSM, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, um, autism was regarded as a pervasive developmental disorder, child whose development was just not on par with children of his or her age. And if before the age of three, the child may have caught up, may have actually achieved the milestones necessary. So just a medical assessment is required to um, corroborate to um, the, the earlier diagnosis. If you arrive here before the age of three and the child um, is properly, properly diagnosed, then there's an amazing system. It's like a daycare system um, in which the child receives every possible um, type of treatment modality. And they usually spend most of the day 
it's run by a, an NGO called Alutaf, um, and they thereafter, from the age of three to the age of six, the children go to nursery school. Then that's when Ms. Radachinuch, Department of Education, formally uh, provides the hours, the budget, the professional staff. Now, um, I'm going to just mention two words <clears throat> which are probably useful. The one is um, Gan, Tikshorti. Gan is a nursery school, kindergarten, and Tikshorti comes from the word Kesher or Tikshoret, which is communication. Because the major defining characteristic of a person on the autistic spectrum is difficulty with Tikshoret, with communication possibly verbal, verbal pragmatics, eye contact, understanding social cues, um, social interaction, et cetera, et cetera. So that is why this, these um, frameworks are called Gantik Shorty or Kitatik Shorty, Betsefer Tik Shorty as, as the years go by. And the other um, Hebrew term that I want to introduce to, to you is called Sal Ishi. We'll, we'll talk about it in a few minutes, but just so that you know what I'm talking about, a sal is a basket and ishi is personal. Um, each child's personal basket is filled with the hours he or she needs. So um, when the child goes to gun, and even if it's at the, at the gun tick short T, the child may need more speech therapy and no OT at all. And there might be, the parents may need um, hadracha, uh, parental supervision guidance or whatever it is. So um, in every framework, the sal ishi is very, very important and it's filled in accordance with the needs of the child. Um, now, as I said, from age three to six, the child will generally go to a gun tikshul tea where all their needs are being provided for, including um, uh, hasa, transport there and back and so on. However, if the child is really high functioning and was perhaps in a, an environment in a framework in SA and they have progressed, they can go to a regular gun and then the sal ishi is filled with hours in which the facilitator, a facilitator, will be with the child at gun and take um, and, and provide a lot of um, the, the, the mediation that a child may need. And uh, that's an acceptable framework as well. When the child um, reaches the age of six, generally sometimes they held back a bit, but when they reach the age of six, they then go to big school, to Kita Aleph. And here too, decisions have to be made as to whether the child should go to a mainstream class and have a facilitator with them. And then they get their sal ishi filled with if they still need speech therapy or whatever it may be. That is obviously a child who is more high functioning, who has, um, the cognitive skills and abilities to cope with a bigger class because our classes here are large. That personally is, is one of my gripes about things in this country. Second of all, there is the possibility of a kitatic shortage, in other words, an ASD class within the mainstream. So it's a smaller class, the teachers are professionally trained, um, but the advantage is that it's at break, they go out and the other kids, and when they have a school function or outing, they're able to participate and share and grow and develop on all those levels. Um, and then there are some children who need the all encompassing Bet Sefer's Tikshul T school, a school where all the children are on the spectrum and where everything is geared towards um, the children's progress, perhaps at the expense of maybe social, uh, decreased social activities, but it, it, it depends, it, it really, really depends. 
And over here, apparently four years ago, probably when I was sort of leaving, um, they gave parents permission to sit in with these committees and to express and explain which of these three settings they think is best for their child. And obviously the parents' wishes, needs, thoughts are, are um, given a lot of credit. However, I'm turning to you, if it's relevant to anybody here, as, um, as someone who sat on these committees for many, many years, that's, uh, it's so difficult to be objective when it comes to choosing the right setting for your child. And we want my child to be mainstreamed and to be with all the other kids and to go on to ULIM and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But together with all that, maybe the child's going to in fact lose out because maybe they're going to, in some or other sphere, they're not going to be able to keep up with the class in terms of the academic learning and, and then not develop various academic or cognitive skills it just depends. So my advice is, if at all possible, look for your ally, whether it may be the uh, classroom teacher, the psychologist who I hope is, is caring and objective, um, but empathic at the same time, and it, whoever it may be, and help them help you make the right decision as to which is the best framework for your child at that particular point in time. Another thing that's important for me to say is that once the child has the diagnosis of ASD, this is for always the army, the army is taking children who volunteer, young people who volunteer to be in special programs, more or less integrated. But what does happen is when there's a transition from junior school, that's Kita Vav, um, to junior high, and from junior high to high school, there is sometimes um, assessments or redone, not the medical, not the diagnoses, not the psychological, just the actual educational functioning, so that one can then decide whether a child they may have outgrown the Kitatic Shortit and be able to be in a regular class at junior high with a facilitator. Um, so um, that's specifically my input on children on the autistic spectrum. Um, I'm going to now um, move over to another, um, to the field of developmental delay, okay? And over here, it's usually delayed speech development. Now, in this particular, if, if this is the problem of your child, then you need to have a document either by a pediatrician, I guess it is, who specialize in child development or a plus a speech therapist or a psychological, a psychologist's report assessment. So those, um, now what, what happens with these children, if there is quite a significant delay in speech development, as I said before, it is going to impact because um, verbalization then is translated to written words, to be able to decipher, understand the written word, to understand between the lines, etc., reading comprehension, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So if there is quite a developmental delay, um, it's recommended that the child goes to what we call a gun tipuli. I suppose you would translate it as a therapeutic gun, where basically the smaller children, the nursery school teachers specifically trained, very many hours of speech therapy, um, as, as many as possible, and um, just helping the child catch, make up that gap, um, helping the child to, to um, be able to go, if possible, to a regular class, a mainstream class in Kita Aleph. Now, what's happening is that um, when the child gets to Kita Aleph, the um, 
child is generally put in a regular mainstream class. They've still got their sal ishi, which could be more speech therapy, maybe somebody to help them with reading so that they don't, so that they keep up with the class, et cetera, et cetera. And they're given a chance for two years, first and second grade, to study in a mainstream class with all the help necessary. Because we believe, and this is relevant to the next uh, category, which will be learning disabilities, that the brain is, has plasticity. The brain, even in adults who learn after, God forbid, accidents and such things, or people who are dyslexic their whole life, the brain is able to, re to generate new neural networks in order to um, compensate for its difficulties. And therefore, children are given a longer period of time till the end of second grade to see whether this can be achieved, in which case the kid just goes ahead and um, is mainstreamed in all senses of the word. But if not, then another thing that one has to come to terms with <clears throat> as a parent is to acknowledge that maybe the child has an organic difficulty and maybe it's something that with um, that they're not going to be able to integrate and, and function fully in a mainstream class and may have to be in a kitaktana, a smaller class for their schooling. I want to mention something else. So I just want to sit. <clears throat> um, is something which <clears throat> it's called RTI, response to intervention. And this is um, if a child is being treated by, as we said, a speech, remedial, whatever, after a reasonable period of time, the child is reassessed. And if there is no improvement, at that point, we can call it a disability. At that point, we know that it's not something, a slow learner or someone who's missed out on a certain stage of development. And um, sometimes it requires afterwards that the child's placed in a smaller setting where they can get the help they need. Um, this brings me right away to learning disabilities, where what's important here are two things as well is the plasticity of the brain and the RTI, the response to intervention. Now, um, usually learning, the potentially learning disabled child, because they're cognitively intact, cognitively there's no problem, they, um, this is picked up in, at nursery school, especially um, the preschool year. Uh, here it's called Gan Chova, every child has to attend. And the Ganenit is trained and the psychologist comes to the gun frequently to help her see which children are, have potential learning disabilities. They're not remembering their letters. They're not associating sounds with letters. They're not learning to rhyme. They're not remembering all sorts of things, other kids' names or all the names on their kids' lockers and all sorts of things. And then in this case, in this is, is kind of on the borderline of special ed and, and regular ed. The children are often, it's often suggested that they spend a, a, another year at Gun, Shana no Sefet, another year at Gun, provided they're not too old. I mean, you know, if they like within half a year of, of, the, of school going age, and then there's a Ganenit who comes to the Gun, specially trained. She's called, called a Ganenit Shiluv. She helps the child integrate. A, in, with, into the gun, and she prepares the child for Kita Aleph in every way possible. Um, now, um, again, over here, we allow the child to develop with help until the end of second grade. And we don't label them as dyslexic or dysgraphic or complex learning disabilities until the end of second grade because of the plasticity of the brain, because each child has their own pace of learning and developing. 
So um, the child will get remedial help. The response to intervention will be assessed at the end of Kita Bet, second grade. And then from third grade, there are three options. Um, okay, I, I'll have to, we'll address that after that, okay? Fine. Um, the three possibilities that there are is mainstream with remedial help, and there's a lot, a lot of hours. <clears throat> um, second one is a smaller class for children with learning disabilities, 14 pupils in the class, sometimes 15, but the teacher trained to work with special ed, this goes until matric. This, if the child needs it, um, he remains in such a class where um, the exams, where the tests, where whatever, the syllabus is tailored to him or her, but um, they do regular tests, exams. Uh, and when I say tailored, they get extra time, the questions read to them, all the accommodations, but generally speaking, it's they mainstreamed. <clears throat> and then thirdly, um, some kids who just never learn to read or uh, fluently, adequately, or they're investing so much energy in um, decoding words that they're not understanding what they're reading and so on. These children may then go to a special school for learning disabled pupils. Now, they've got intact intelligence. There's no problem here with... Um, uh, all these children are cognitively healthy, well functioning, but they have problems with um, specific learning, reading, writing, spelling, and sometimes it's multi, um, what's the right word, where th there may be an attention deficit order, disorder as well, um, which makes learning difficult. I think at this point, I'd just like to mention that um, a, a, a ADD or ADHD is not a learning disability. It's not included in the DSM and all this type of thing. However, if there is comorbidity, if it comes together with a learning disability or a speech delay or whatever it is, then obviously um, it will be considered as part of the child's problem and addressed in the best way possible. Okay, is, um, I'll, I'll continue. Um, there are other categories of special ed in Israel. Um, children with rare diseases, which um, it's usually, well, whatever help they need, they're entitled to. That just needs medical documentation. Children with major visual or hearing impediments. Now, gladly, I'd like to say that there are less and less children who um, have or hearing uh, impaired because of the cochlear implant. I think that in South Africa, I know that it exists as well, and that these children, if at the right age, are able to very, very often catch up and learn speech and learn communication and they are in mainstream classrooms but there are there's an amazing organization called Shema and there's another one I forget which is for Ghana and which is for older, older children who actually give these children help specially trained professionals also we've got something in Israel called acoustic classrooms where the whole classroom is actually made acoustic, if that's the right way to explain it, in which extraneous noises are um, excluded, where the teacher speaks through a specific uh, gadget, so the right decibel, not too high tones, not too low tones, so that, that the somewhat hearing impaired child can hear and can be part of a regular class. With a visually impaired, um, it's pretty similar. Um, and obviously with, with these children, again, medical documents suffice. Now we come to something a little bit more difficult, and that is emotional or psychiatric difficulties. Um, 
Unfortunately, and there's different theories as to why, there's been a tremendous increase in the number of children with emotional or psychiatric problems at a young age, where kids are even needing medication, another moot point, but still. And um, these mainly, mainly characterized by anxiety disorders of different intensity. And there's what we'd call a generalized anxiety disorder or social anxiety, um, a severe OCD. And here too, the children are placed in a mainstream classroom with facilitator um, and given um, seven to eight hours a week of emotional help, group therapy, um, and hoping to prevent at a later stage that the child will have to go to a special school which caters for children with these problems where they can't be mainstreamed any longer. So this is the whole advantage. Um, okay, I'll come back to that just now. And then the other um, um, subcategory is children with behavior problems. Um, these are children who have difficulty moderating, if that's the right word, their behavioral responses, acting out excessive reactions, um, not able to inhibit um, their behavior from bullying to destruction to whatever it is. Here too, there's an amazing program in which the children are kept as long as possible in mainstream with a facilitator. Um, they found actually that group therapy is helpful these, for these children to develop empathy, to understand what their behavior is doing to others. Um, parents are very, very much involved because sometimes there's very mixed messages at home as to what's okay and what isn't. And um, it's an amazing program. They, they're doing very, very well. And the whole aim here too is to pre prevent the child having to attend um, a very specialized school for children with severe behavioral problems um, at a later stage. Um, I think, let me just see if I can put this on the screen. Let's try. This isn't. Yeah, 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 let me try. Um, I think that, um, yeah, there are two things which I haven't mentioned, and these are children with physical disabilities, largely cerebral palsy, and the Duchenne, which is um, MS. Now, um, here too, whenever possible, the child will be mainstreamed, they'll have a facilitator, they'll have help. However, sometimes, the disability is such that the child needs to be in a physical environment where there are, um, uh, you know, things on the wall and, and in the toilets and this and that to keep the child safe and protect them in the, on the playgrounds and so on, and to provide them with a reasonable education, a good education, but in a safe environment. And the last thing I wanted to say is in addition to the hours allocated by the education department, there are subsidized therapies given by the health funds. So once you have joined your Kupat Cholim in Israel, come here and um, started paying however it works, I'm not sure, um, and you hand over because all the Kupat Cholim have got um, children, uh, child development centers with a whole team, people who know how to understand and interpret the reports, and they are then obligated, once the child has a diagnosis of ASD or learning disability or speech delay or whatever, to, um, to, to give the necessary um, therapy to the child. There's three therapies per child, three different 
built and here parents do contribute but far far less than you do in the um, open market if that's the, the right way to say um, let me just get rid of that okay um, I think that maybe um, I could just last thing as I said the special schools that exist are for pupils with physical disabilities. We talked about the CP, Duchenne, um, autism for children who need an all encompassing environment. Oh, something very important. I'll come back to it in a minute. For children, as I said, with behavioral or emotional problems, which obviously, hopefully, one does not want the child to reach that stage, stage of functioning or not functioning. And then special schools for learning to say remedial schools i guess we used to call them in south africa lastly i didn't address the issue of mental retardation um children who are mentally retarded in other words they score on an iq test in the low below the low average range and then there's something called borderline intelligence where there too the child could be put in a smaller class, um, depending on the child's general functioning. And then there's mild mental retardation, moderate and severe. And here too, it's with great difficulty. Sometimes parents do not are not able to allow their children to be um, put into the, the correct school setting because a child with mild mental retardation can be taught to read, to write, basic, very basic math, um, independence, and these schools are unbelievable. I worked in one for six years. Then children with moderate mental retardation, there is less emphasis on learning, maybe basic reading skills, very, very, very basic stuff, and rather independence, personal hygiene, um, enhancing social skills, but one's got to be realistic as to what the child is capable of cognitively. And then sadly, um, severe mental retardation, we have a place in Kvasaba, which is similar to frail care for the elderly, but there are children like that, Chas Khalila, and there, there are environments where these children are taken care of on a daycare basis. And um, so that is basically sums up what I um, what I wanted to share with you this evening. Um, Aviva, do you want to kind of take over? Thank you, Dana. Wow, that's a wealth of knowledge that you gave us. So um, there's some questions in the chat. So yeah. I'll read it out for you. The first one, um, who can I Zoom and speak to as we have two learning disability mentally delayed children? Um, if, if you want to give them mm, my details, I'll be glad to listen and obviously you know refer on or give the best advice that i can okay great thank you so everybody on the zoom has my email address so feel free to reach out and uh, we'll be in touch over email okay the next question is there a place for children who have general remedial learning disabilities my daughter's in grade nine and has been in the remedial school through primary school and now high school I'm resistant to make alias. I'm not sure if there's a place for her. Her Hebrew is non-existent. Um, yeah, I, I think that possibly it is difficult in grade nine. Um, uh, there are schools like, for example, Abaychil Tamar and the Beit Eckstein. So they're, they're very specialized schools. But again, I don't know, other than the Sha'ot Olim, which every child's entitled to, um, whether that would be sufficient to bring your daughter to a, a reasonable level of uh, Hebrew conversation. Um, 
Um, that's something perhaps we can find out about, Avida, and and you could answer okay, that great, question so. very specifically because I don't want to say, yes, yeah, sure, no problem, because um, the remedial schools here, as we said, Beit Eckstein and Beit Shil Tamal, they the children are cognitively intact. The the difficulties are learning disabilities. Okay, so you can also be in touch uh, via email. Okay, the next question, how do you determine which path to go when a child has various challenges? Um, would be helpful to know what the challenges are. Um, mm -hmm. Can the person write perhaps or? Uh, okay. Um, Heidi, would you like to specify? Language issues. What age are you talking about? Okay, well, here you've got to do the um, differential diagnosis. This 12 to 14, okay. Um, I, I would definitely go to an expert on autism. And by doing the ADOS or something similar, they would be able to differentiate whether it's a language delay, which the person hasn't caught up with, or if it's connected to a much larger um, network of functioning, like we, we found with ASD. The best answer I can give you. Okay, uh, another question. My son is 13. He's a highly functioning ASD child who was misdiagnosed for puberty. He's in grade seven and goes to a small mainstream school with an ABA facilitator. Mm -hmm. Well, please go be coming to Israel for the new academic year. Who do I talk to about what he would need when we get to Israel and to help him get him, get him placed correctly? Do you have any idea where you're going to be when you first come to Israel? Because then one could approach the nearest Miss Machleket Achinuch or Shiruta Psychologi. So Natania. Natanya, they've got an excellent school psychological services there. They really, really are good. And um, I would say that we could, uh, you know, you could try and put this person in touch with the, the relevant person at the Shiruta uh, Psychologi in Natanya, who could then um, work out what, what the next step should be. Okay, thank you. Uh, does anybody else uh, have a question? You can also unmute yourself. Feel free to unmute your microphone. Okay, another question. If your child uses augmentative communication, is this something that's also encouraged in the schools, uh, i.e. is it worth pursuing here? Can you just elaborate a little bit? Because I don't think I'm really familiar with the concept. Please. So in the meantime, Diana, uh, someone has requested if you'd be willing to post your contact details in the in the chat. Yeah, if I can manage. <laughs> um, if, not, if not, I'll do so, uh, no problem chat um if i give um my email is that, is that yeah, your, your email would be great okay can you see it Uh, I don't see it. I, I can also post it in the chat. I think you can do that, please. It's fine. Um, okay. The um, I see what you're saying. Your child has started using an iPad as his speech is not clear at all. Is it worth pursuing using the iPad if I plan to make Aliyah? No, it certainly is used in Israel, definitely. Um, but um, what, what could you just add here? What framework? 
where, where the child is. Um, okay, then that came up. Um, in, I guess it would be more, um, if the child has a facilitator, the facilitator could certainly help mediate between the child and the teacher and the class. If the child is in a small class, um, then basically the teacher should probably be able to uh, be able to communicate with the child. I, the kids that I worked with using iPads were usually the ch children in the school um, for mild mental retardation, but uh, I, I don't know. Um, I should imagine there, there is an openness to all this. <clears throat> Uh, does anyone else have a question? I've posted Diana's email in the chat, and my email address is, uh, of course, where you got your Zoom link. Okay. And we've got a thank you. Thank you so much. It was very useful. And someone is asking if you work on over Zoom. Um, depends. <laughs> You know, if it's convenient and so on, yes, but generally not since the, well, are we post-COVID or <laughs> slightly post-COVID? I prefer less, but obviously sometimes it's useful. I just want to ask everybody if, if there was something that wasn't clear or um, confusing or something, please mention it right now in, in case there's something that I need to clarify or um. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Thank you so much. That was incredible. And uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us. We will also have a recording of the session that will be available. Thank you once again. Uh, wishing everyone a good uh, rest of week and good health. And thanks once again. Bye, Latov. Bye, Latov. Thank you, everyone. <clears throat>